The SNES is a very important console in the history of Nintendo and games as a whole. When this console came out, I was like negative years old, which means I never grew up playing this console because, you know, I didn't exist. Since I've never actually played it, the only things I know about the SNES is just stuff I can look up. Like how the SNES sold over 49 million units, which is kind of surprising to me because I've never met anyone that actually owns one. Luckily for me, with the power of the Switch, I have access to a ton of games that are for the SNES. SNES. One day while I was looking through all these games, I started to wonder, would these games actually hold up today? Like, for example, I know most of you probably don't watch sports, but just bear with me for a second. Will Chamberlain was this basketball player that had all these accolades that are actually just insane, but he isn't widely considered to be the greatest basketball player ever. This is for a few reasons, but the biggest one is because of the time that he played in. He did most of his crazy stuff in the early 60s, and at the time, people just weren't as good at playing basketball as they are now. So in this video today, I'm trying to see if the SNES is kind of like that guy, or if the games on the SNES hold up today to like, kind of a modern standard. To do this really thoroughly, I would play every game in the SNES collection on the Switch, but I don't want to spend like a year and a half on one video, so we're just gonna make it eight games. Four of these games I'll be picking, and then the other four will be randomly generated by a little mystery wheel. While I'm reviewing these games, the only grace I'll give them is that I won't hold graphics against them that much. I think doing that would just be a little bit too unfair to the games, and also modern games have retro style graphics that work great. I'm not actually going to be beating all of these games, but I will be putting a solid amount of time into all of them. I want to give these games a real chance, but I'm not going to spend 28 hours beating Earthbound for this video. As of writing this, I actually haven't done my random picks yet, so let's do that now. So this is the first time I've ever like recorded anything live without a script, so uh, I don't know what I'm going to say. Uh, let's just spin this for my four games. Alright, so the first one will be... Oh, it was almost a Kirby game. Okay, Joe and Mac 2 Lost in the Tropics. I hope that I don't need to have played Joe and Mac 1 because I don't know what this game is. Second up, we have... Go to Star Fox. Yeah, okay, I've heard of Star Fox. Stay. Oh no, Super Metroid, that's good too. Okay, these are like too good. So hopefully the last one's a weird one like the first one because I want to have like random games. Okay, and... I'm not doing Joe and Mac, we're respinning. I can't, I can't do Joe and Mac 1 and 2, that's not happening. Okay, this is cheating but we're doing a fifth one. <laughs> okay, we're not doing Joe and Mac 1, that's just not... We're not making this the Joe and Mac Nate YouTube video. Okay, Stunt Race FX. We're gonna do a, a sixth game because I already have F Zero, but I, I'll keep this if it's different enough. But this will be the emergency sixth game, or fifth, fifth game. John Mac One did not count. Doesn't matter how weird. Okay, Big Run. I don't know what. <laughs> that sounds like I messed up and typed in the wrong thing. So maybe I, I don't know. Big Run, Big Run. Anybody? Anybody know? So, like probably many of you, the first time I ever heard of this game was through Smash Bros and Captain Falcon. At first, I literally thought this was a fighting game, because I mean, what else are you supposed to gather from Captain Falcon and Smash Bros? Like, I might be stupid most of the time, but this is a completely reasonable mistake. Eventually, I caught on to what F-Zero was before making this video, but I've never really played it before. Anyway, right off the bat, this game has an amazing soundtrack. These songs sound so cool and just fit the atmosphere of the game perfectly. Like, listen to this one. Or this one. Or this one. These songs are all obviously different, but they all keep the same vibe, which I really like. Now, the gameplay here isn't super complicated. I mean, come on, it's just the racing game. You know, you just you just go forward and then you know sometimes you, you might have to turn just because it isn't super complicated though doesn't mean it isn't hard this game makes you work for first place I really felt like I should have gone through some sort of training to even be allowed to open this game up like when they started adding these magnet things or the wind 
Oh my, the wind. Oh my god. I almost forgot about the wind. I think they made this game pretty difficult because there isn't actually that much content here. So if you get stuck on a lot of the tracks, it makes the game feel like it's longer even though you can beat it in like two hours if you're actually good at the game. This trope was all the rage in older games, especially in the whole arcade era. This is because the more you died, the more quarters you would spend at the arcade machine. And once games on home consoles became a thing, they had to keep you occupied long enough to warrant paying a lot of money for a video game. And, uh, um, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, I think F-Zero was made artificially harder than it should have been because they wanted people to play the game longer. That's my one conspiracy theory for the day. Uh, thanks for listening. I actually don't have a real issue with the game being hard or anything, it just makes the game feel a little bit more outdated. Something I do actually have an issue with though is that the game is only one player. How are you guys going to make a racing game and only make it one player? That's just crazy to me. So yeah, I think this game is pretty cool, but it definitely feels outdated and definitely does not hold up to today's standards. Luckily this isn't the only game I'm talking about though, so let's move on to the next game. Super Metroid is the game I played the longest out of all of these games, and oh my god is this game good. I think I really like games that are in this style, you know, the Metroidvania genre. This series started a whole genre and led to games like Hollow Knight, Ori and the Blind Forest, and I don't know, Black Ops 2? Just like F-Zero, this game has a very strong vibe that's held together by... music? I don't know whether to call sounds like this... music? but whatever, it makes the environment here feel so much more eerie and dangerous. When you start playing this game, it's super hard to put down because the sense of exploration and the fact that you never really feel like you have everything you want to do 100% down. Unless you've like 100% beaten the game or whatever, but that's not what I'm talking about. You'll probably have multiple objectives in your mind that you can just go and complete and you just don't want to stop playing until you do that. When the game gives you a new ability, not only can you use it and move on to the next area, but in your mind you're like, oh, I can go back and use this somewhere else. That's pretty cool. So now you're able to backtrack and go to areas that you've seen but you couldn't necessarily get to before. Similar to F-Zero, Metroid does have an issue that older games tend to have. I don't think it's as glaring as F-Zero, but there still is something. This game is very cryptic, and sometimes that's good, but other times it's like, what the hell? Like I didn't know there was a sprint button until I got to this room where you had to sprint and the only reason I found out about the sprint button is because I looked it up. Now I'm sure the game manual probably included some section about controls but baby you're a video game you can just throw a control guide right into your settings. The game is also kind of cryptic with secret explodable openings. Like from this room how are you supposed to know that these two blocks up here can be shot and destroyed? Well I didn't I only found out that one of them could be destroyed so I spent like 10 Real life minutes trying to get through the gap inside of my little ball thing. My last little complaint about this game is that the movement feels a little clunky, but that could be just due to the fact that I'm playing on an emulated version on the Switch with the wrong remote, so I'm just gonna let that slide. Outside of that, this game really doesn't feel all that ancient, and I would say this game holds up completely today. Yup, sound the alarm. This right here is a classic. I mean, it's hard to go anywhere without somebody mentioning Joe and Mac 2 lost in the tropics. The dentist refused me because she was so busy trying to play this game. I tried to go to one of my economics classes this week and all they talked about was Joe's PPF line and the relationship between his coins and uh, the hearts. But I don't know. <laughs> that one was for all my econ heads out there. <laughs> what am I talking about? Now the game that even the great Jimmy Carter, happy 100th birthday by the way, calls criminally underrated is uh, well, I'm not gonna sit here and say that this review was extremely helpful. This game is obviously made to be played with two people and I didn't really have that luxury when I played this game, so I can't be completely fair to this, but let's be real here. This game isn't some sort of life changing experience. I know I'm getting a little controversial here, but this is just a very basic platformer but with dinosaurs. When I play a game like Super Mario Maker 2, I feel completely in control of Mario no matter how bad I am at that game. Controlling Joe here does not feel that great, and I kinda need him to control great because this is a platformer and if I don't control him great, what am I playing this game for? I don't really think this game is anything special or holds up at all, and if you really need a co-op game to play with someone else, just play It Takes Two or some fucking Call of Duty like a real man. 
The best character from Melee actually has a real game, and it's probably the coolest and most ahead of its time idea out of all of these games here, except for maybe Super Metroid. Like a video game about controlling a spaceship and fighting enemies in the sky is probably the sickest idea you can come up with. Hopefully a game studio makes something like this now that doesn't completely suck. Anyway, I haven't talked about the graphics at all outside of the intro because there's some modern games that have retro graphics that do great, like Stardew Valley, Terraria, or even the biggest game like ever, Minecraft. So an older game with older graphics should hold up if the art style they're choosing doesn't age really bad. If you want an example of graphics aging poorly, uh, just look at this game. Look, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I played this game for like 30 minutes and I could not tell what was going on the whole time. I'm glad this series turned into good games, but this one kinda sucks. It obviously does not hold up to today's standards because I can't see. Like, I can't even review it outside of that because I don't know what's going on on the screen. So let's just move on to the next game so I can stop hurting your guys' eyes. Donkey Kong Country is the favorite game of every dad in America around the age of 50. This is for good reason though, because this game is a classic. Maybe even more than Joe and Mac 2. Looking at the graphics in this game, you would think this game came out way after the SNES because it looked great. I don't exactly remember what they did, but it was something like rendering in 3D and then taking like pictures or something and then creating a 2D model and then like that's what they use. So it looks 3D, but it's actually 2D. I'm not going to act like I know everything about the graphics here, but not only does this game look good, but it also plays amazing. Like this game is so good, the water levels are good. Like what? Like this is a game where you can ride a fish. Are you kidding me? This game does provide a little challenge, but it's not overly annoying and makes each level pretty satisfying to complete. Throughout each level, you have little objectives you want to do like get all the Kong letters or collect bananas, which I think is pretty important because it makes you want to explore each level rather than just trying to get to the end as quickly as possible. I know I've talked about music a lot in this video, but this game has one of the best soundtracks of all time. You have for sure heard at least one of these songs in some random YouTube video as background because they're just all that incredible. With all that said, this game stands up incredibly well, like maybe even more than Metroid Prime, and that's saying a lot, because Metroid Prime is awesome. Now if I had a game that I was most excited to play for this video, it would probably be this one. All the other games that I've really enjoyed so far, I've either at least played them a little before, or played something that's super similar, but I've never played a Yoshi game before in my life, so I was super excited to try one out. Now I've gotta say first and foremost, this game might have the award for most annoying sound in any video game I've ever heard. Baby Mario crying every time you get hit with something is probably the worst decision I've ever seen a developer make. I get that it adds urgency, but my god, I wanted to rip my ears out and stop playing this game every time I got hit by something. Anyway, there are things I like about this game though. The art and silly design of everything is really fun and pleasing to look at. It almost seems like everything in this game was hand drawn and that's the kind of charm I love to see out of older Nintendo games. To fight enemies in this game, you can suck them up and turn them into eggs, which is uh very Yoshi-like. Then you can take those eggs and throw them at other enemies, which would be really cool if the controls for doing this didn't feel horrible. You have to activate throwing mode and then time a button press for the angle you want to be throwing at. This is such an annoying way to throw things and it makes this game feel kind of clunky. Outside of that little issue though, this game is great. I love the little hint blocks because the game actually teaches you how to play it, but you don't need to activate them if you already know how. I also like the little charm of passing Baby Mario to a different Yoshi after each level. You can be a Yoshi helicopter, like enough said. This game holds up okay and with a modern control setup, this game would be even better. Did I mention how annoying Baby Mario crying was? I thought this was a racing game before I did my like emergency pick, but I don't want to redo another spin, so let's just give it a try. Um, why does the menu look like it's in screensaver mode? And I feel carsick. Actually, you know what? How about we just... So yeah, I'll be reviewing this game. Now right off the bat here, you can totally notice that this game has some Star Fox itis with its graphics here. So yeah, just like that game, this game has some goofy looking graphics, but at least this time I can mostly tell what's going on. I think the most glaring issue here is that it feels super laggy when you're just driving in this game, which is, you know, the main thing you do. Like you can't sit there and tell me that this game doesn't kind of look like it's in slow motion. Also when you crash into walls, you can see through the map, which makes this feel like more of a beta version of the game rather than a full release. 
The game also looks like it was made for babies, so I don't think I'm the target audience here, but it's pretty clear that this game does not stand up to the test of time, and I think I should move on to the last game of the video here. So I have a lot to say about this game, like a lot. So much so that I think I'm gonna make a video about it in the future, so if you wanna see that, just leave a comment in the comments below. I'm gonna be honest here, I have a save for this game where I'm much further into it, but for this video, I'm just gonna be playing through the beginning of the game. I wanna start out with the bad and then get to the good here, so first of all, we should talk about the combat. Specifically, the amount of combat in the game. To get to the first objective in this game, you have to battle like 20 stray dogs, and the fights in this game aren't exactly super fast or anything, so it starts to get pretty old pretty fast. Also, sometimes it can be a little vague on where you're supposed to be going, but a huge part of this game is talking to people, so eventually you'll find out. Yep, that's all the complaints I have for this game. That's right, Ness from Smash Bros has a pretty good game on his hands. Wow, is that three references to Smash Bros in one video? You'd think I'd be good at the game or something if I mentioned it this much, but I'm not. Earthbound is probably the funniest game I've ever played. The NPCs in this game sometimes say the funniest things ever. Like, hey, what the hell, why are you calling me out like this? It also has this quirkiness to it, like this interaction at the start of the game with the photographer, or especially the music. A lot of the songs in this game are just full of these random sounds and they somehow work just like, listen to this one. Like how do they make this song sound normal? I really don't want this part of the video to go on for too long, so I'll just let you know. If Pokemon and Dragon Quest can have you fight a million enemies in the game and still sell well, then Earthbound definitely holds up to modern standards. Alright, so I've looked at a lot of SNES games today, and I will admit that the wheel gave me some games that probably made the SNES look more favorable than it should have been. Like if I got 4 games like Big Run, this video probably would have turned out a little different. Most of the games here though still didn't hold up amazingly well. Not that that's a bad thing, it's just that games in the past 15 years have been so good that it makes older generations of game look old. There are those games like Donkey Kong and Metroid though that stand the test of time and show that they're not just good SNES games, they're just good games. You could even say great games if you want to be a little crazy, I guess. So does the SNES hold up today? Eh, kind of. I don't think you can sell most of these games for $60 today, but there are a select few that you can get absolutely lost in. So while it may not fully stand up today, it was a necessary step in making all of the great games we have now. Thank you guys for watching this video, and I hope you really liked it. If you liked the video, please leave it a like, it really helps me, and subscribe if you wanna. That's all I got for today. Okay, bye!